Our guest today is a pioneer of performance. He's not only invested in the athletic future of a nation, but has just released a book which includes groundbreaking research on fascia and how it can improve speed, power, and injury prevention. An All-American in track and field, he went on to start his youth training franchise at age 24, training over 650,000 athletes with his world-class programming and presentations, from NFL teams to industry icons such as Nike. So for a lesson in resilience, and how our bodies are more like plants and machines. Please join me in welcoming Parisi Speed School founder, Bill Parisi, to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Bill, thank you for joining me here. I think we're in Soho in New York. Yes, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Matt. And the, the funny thing is we've known each other now for a couple of years and we've spent quite a bit of time together. And I suppose I've known you from, I, I suppose, our business relationship. And, and, and doing research, I'm like, I didn't realize all this stuff about you, you know, <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm impressed with you and your organization as well. Yeah, you're, you're very humble, but I didn't realize the, the story. Uh, and um, yeah, so you know, t t share, share the story, you know, where, sure. how, how did this whole thing start? I mean, it started as a high, undersized, slow high school athlete. Um, got involved with weight training in, in the early 1980s and realized I improved performance and then never stopped. You know, went out for track and field, played football, and then fell in love with the javelin throw. You know, that was, I, I was pretty good at it and competed in, it in college at the Division I level, wind up getting a scholarship. And the training facet of the javelin throw is, is pretty much trained to get faster, to run down the runway with a seven foot spear in your hand, then all of a sudden you gotta stop. You're running almost 100%, you know, 90% intensity. You gotta stop and transfer all that force into your arm. So strength, flexibility, uh, speed, all those things, that's all I trained for. And I went to seminars all throughout college, around the world. I went to Finland to train with the world's best, you know, in javelin. And I learned, wow, this is the 1980s. And I'm in Finland saying the gyms are open, medicine balls, open track, physio balls, kettlebells. I'm like, I gotta bring this training back to America. We're not training like that because every health club in America in the 1980s was a sea of Nautilus equipment and cardio. Every health club was like a Planet Fitness. Like every club was just filled with equipment. And I opened my first club in 93 with this concept. Uh, 3,000 square foot sports performance, open track, med balls, you know, physio balls, all these things, movements and um, kettlebells had all these things early, early on and, and then continued to grow from there. You know, then from there opened up multiple clubs. I mean, that small club in three years, we did $973,000 in 3,000 square feet in 1997. Jeez. And uh, Tom Plummer would attest to that because you know, he was my consultant at the time. And we were the highest grossing facility in the country, in the world, and might even still be in terms of, you know, we were so small, 3,000 square feet, doing 973,000 in 1997. So now we're over 20 years ago, so the value of money is a little greater now. So um, what, 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 what do you think kind of made that such a success all those years ago, then? just because it was different? Or what, what? People gravitated to that type of training back then, and that's what drove my business. And now it's everywhere, but we've been doing this since 93. Mm -hmm. I obviously started with young athletes, but then we started doing these types of things with adults as well, and, and then it just, it just grew from there, and then we decided to start licensing it. After you know, 12 years of doing this, we, you know, after a decade, we said, maybe we should share this. You know, maybe we should license this because we've done it successfully for 12 years at the time. And then we started licensing in 2005. Right. And, and, and just kind of prior to that, I heard that you were sort of on, the, on your way to, to an Olympic career as well. Was that correct? Yeah. Well, I made the Olympic trials in, in 1988 and uh, I was the youngest competitor there. And then uh, went on to be a multiple time Division I All-American in track and field. Uh, and then in 92, I blew out my ankle, um, you know, before the trials in 92. So my career basically ended my left ankle. Um, so coming down the runway, it was, it was a gravel and I slipped and then it caught and it just, it just went out and I never, you know, never came back. You know, I didn't get surgery. It didn't really warrant surgery. I was 20, at that point I was 23 at the time, 24. Although javelin throwers peak at 27, 28, this is America, not Finland. I needed to make money because I was $50,000 in debt, living at home with my parents. And they said, you, you might not be able to make a lot of money in the javelin. You need to figure something out. And they were right. So, but you know, I got a van, a $500 van, 
$50,000 in debt, living in my parents' basement, 23 years old at the time, started driving around and giving free clinics, like going to high schools and saying, I've got some interesting training information, I'd love to share it with you. And uh, I got a lot of doors slammed in my face. A lot of people said, no, you're crazy, you can't improve speed. It's a, natu it's a natural gift that you know, people can't improve. And then now the research shows that we can improve speed. Uh, but fa finally started to get some people to buy in and then that's how it really started. That was, that was the key. Mm. So, so how did you decide, with, you know, but there, there's obviously sort of two different paths. There was the traditional health club, which you'd obviously sort of made successful. And then there was the, I guess, the sort of youth coaching in terms of, you know, training for sport. What, how did you decide on which one of those roads to go down? Well, I really, I looked at the market and I said, you know, where's there a challenge? Where's there a need, right? Where, where's there problems in the market? And where's the passion? Well, back then I thought, parents and kids were pretty passionate about sports. 25 years later, man, we're crazy about sports and our kids in sports to a point where it's, it's maybe too much, right? So I realized, you know, speed is the foundation to all field and court sports. Like if you're fast at a young age, you know, seven to 17, you have a much better chance to, to compete and make the team, be on the team and, and be part of that team. So I, focused on speed development and and I said this is really what the market needs and I started doing that back in 93 when we opened up our first place and but really it was market driven but also speed for us is is the product but the, the real deliverable the real outcome is what it does when we help an athlete get faster ultimately it improves their confidence so making that impact in that child's life is really what we're about. Our, our mission is really about empowering America's youth, now the world's youth, because we're in China, we're in Saudi Arabia, but empowering a kid, because we know at 18 or 22, 23, and for a very select few, maybe a little older, the athletic career begins to end, right? It, it comes to an end sooner or later. But the life skills, the work ethic, the discipline, the camaraderie, the teamwork, all these things, the honesty, being honest with yourself, because we teach our athletes, hey, did you, know, did you give me your best on that drill? Because a lot of people say, oh, I tried, or oh, I tried. No, try is only a lie you believe, right? So don't tell me you tried. Did you, did you give me your best, yes or no? So it's about being honest. So teaching our athletes life skills, where the parents pound it into them, but sometimes with parents, it goes in this year, it comes out this one, when they hear it from their coach, their performance coach, you know, and the kid's like, wow. And that's, to me, that's the best thing about this business. When a parent comes to me and says, I can't believe that my kid is now cleaning their room or my kid is now going to bed early because you told them to or because you're teaching them the life skills that reinforces it. So to me, that, that is the most gratifying. And we train pro athletes and all that's fun and good, but connecting with that athlete and giving them or empowering them those with these life skills is really what the Parisi Speed School is all about. So we use speed and the science of speed and all the training, the equipment, that's all awesome, but, but making that connection, and that's really what we look for when we hire coaches. Do they love kids? Do they really want to empower kids? If we find people that do that, we're going to make you a successful coach. Mm. Why do you think, that the, you know, particularly now, that there's you know, more and more youth that are, you know, they're, they're very out of shape, you know, kind of in a, almost like in a dangerous condition. Uh, you're working with, you know, you're working with a lot of people and, and really impacting their lives. But, you know, what, what do you think is sort of going wrong in general? Because that, you know, kids obesity is increasing at a rapid rate and we don't yeah. seem to be solving anything there. Yeah, well, you know, the way we look at that, 75% of all kids under the age of 14, at least in the U.S., play organized sports. So the way we look at it, we use sports as a motivational vehicle. And we know we're not going to solve every problem or be able to work with every kid. So we say, okay, here's 75% of all kids. They play sports. There's something that's going to motivate them. We're going to help you improve your sport. And that's motivating. So to me, I feel we're making an impact because we're getting more kids to move. Now, just because they play sports doesn't mean they're getting into shape. I mean, we always talk about going out uh, on a baseball field and standing in the outfield for you know most of the game with your hands on your knees, maybe running for a ball once in a while, getting up at the plate, and if you make contact, maybe running to first or second, if you make contact. 
Then after the game, going out for a couple slices of pizza, a couple cans of soda, that's a weight gaining event, right? That's not a weight loss event. So performance training very much is helping not only these athletes maintain weight, but get into better shape, build confidence, and really become better at their sport, develop these skill sets. And most importantly, along with that, build injury resiliency. So um, the obesity situation in the U.S. is, is starting to flatten in terms of youth. Uh, we're getting, we're starting to get uh, better data. Uh, it's still a long way to go, but I feel that more training with kids and not just playing sports, but real, real training is gonna help them. And now we're making that connection at a younger age because we start them at seven. Mm -hmm. And it's gross motor skill development, it's movement literacy, we, you know, or motor vocabulary, if you will. These are the things we're doing with them at a constant uh, motion, a constant session where one hour long, it's constantly moving. We give them the rest periods, but with those younger kids, it's, it's, it's very powerful. Mm. How much of it is, the, is working on mindset? Because some of the things that you've spoken about, you know, such as even helping them you know, go and clean their rooms and that sort of stuff, you know, what, what percentage of it is just teaching you know, physical skills and, and what part of it is working on the mind? That's a great question. Um, you know, I have the luxury because we have now 100 plus locations and I have many different consultants that are on retainer that we pay, our corporate team we pay. So we have numerous uh, sports psychologists that are on our, you know, um, team. Uh, and we train our coaches on how to inspire and motivate. So we'll do different metaphors with, with kids in terms of um, during the session, opening rituals, closing rituals, goal setting. Uh, we'll do simple things like we'll tell every kid in the class, you know, this is an example. I want everyone to give me, uh, make me two promises that you're gonna give me 100% effort today and you're gonna do exactly as I tell you. And everybody says, yes, coach. And then the coach says, okay, I want everyone right now to raise your right hand as high as you possibly can. Everyone raises their hand. Then the coach says, okay, great. Everyone have it as high as they can. Raise your hand one inch higher. So they might stand on their toes or jump, and they say, why didn't you do that the first time? <laughs> oh, they didn't think about it, and they said, well, the reason why you didn't, you didn't have a big enough why. If I said, get your hand two feet higher, and I'm gonna give you $100,000, the kids would figure that out right away. And we teach the kids, if you have a big enough why, you'll figure out how. So what's your why? Why are you here today? You know, what's, what's your why in your sport? What do you, you know, visualize, create your vision, create your dream, think about it, write it down. So we're training our coaches to communicate with these metaphors, with this type of communication to our athletes. And to me, that's what makes Parisi different. Anyone can learn drills, go to seminars. It's the delivery. It's how we deliver the information. It's with passion, it's, it's wrapped around metaphors, it's wrapped around motivation. And we put a lot of time into that. So I'm hiring sports psychologists. We have hundreds upon hundreds of training videos for our coaches in sports psychology where they can you know, just motivate a kid during the session because we're in the motivation business. People think we're in the fitness business. Like if you're in the fitness business and you think, oh, you're just gonna transfer information, you're gonna have a tough time making money because most people aren't motivated. Most kids aren't motivated. We're in the motivation business, and that's where we wrap what we like to feel. We wrap really great science-based content in the Parisi Speed School, backed by peer-reviewed research. Everything we do is research-based, but delivered in a way that's inspiring and motivating to get a, a child to, to, to change behavior to, to, to the next level, right? Teaching them to, to be responsible for themselves and, and, and go to that next step. How, do you think it's really important to set those skills whilst they're young? And is it more difficult to kind of build that in when people become adults? What, what's your view on that? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously yeah, younger kids, I mean, kids are a product of their environment, right? And, and that's why a lot of kids, when they come to us, we like to create a great environment. We have a lot of motivated kids that, that, that come, uh, or we, you know, the kids that want to, you know, the take to the motivation, right? Because a lot of kids that come to us, contrary to popular belief, aren't the best athletes. Uh, we get the average kid, you know, looking to make the team or, you know, compete. Some kids are just rec, rec players, just everybody makes a team. Some kids are trying out for club teams and, you know, they're just average kids. And when we get them in there, you know, they see that this is, this is serious. But what we like to describe the program and how we, we help them come along 
is our program, it's not serious, serious, meaning it's not like professional athletics where if you don't do this well, you're cut or, you know, or, or division one college, that's real serious stuff, right? Uh, we're not, we're not that level, but we're also, so we're not serious, serious, and we're not fun, fun. It's not like, it's not like going to the water park and it's just all about fun. So it's not serious, serious. It's not fun, fun. We're serious fun. Right. So that's what we like to call it. We're serious fun with, with that. Cause you gotta make it fun. Even the pros we train, you gotta make it fun. We have pros that come in high level, add some fun to it. They, they gravitate to it. Their mentality changes because even in work, right? With your people, if you make it fun, you gotta make the work environment fun. And again, it can't be fun, fun. It can't be water park. And it can't be cutthroat where, you know, you don't do this, you're done. You, you gotta blend it. And that's how we, we run our school. That's how we run our business, right? I mean, it's, and, and we believe the behavioral change. People adapt to that. And hopefully they take that on to their careers and their families. Mm. Do you find that? Do you, do you think that some of these sort of, uh, you know, I guess, non, sort of physical skills, do you see some of your athletes take those kind of, um, I guess, uh, you know, in terms of drive, goal setting, do you, do you see them take that into business and life when they go on? Ab absolutely, I mean, it's, it's really incredible. Uh, one of my most uh, successful athletes, uh, uh, a, a man now, he's a man by the name of Justin Leonard, he came in, he was, made his freshman basketball team, but did not see the floor. I, he probably saw the floor his freshman year on the freshman team, uh, maybe a few, you know, 20 minutes the whole year, you know, in, in, I don't know, 25 games, right? The average a minute a game. Was really upset he came in, we you know, worked with him through his whole high school career. This was back in 94, 95. He went on to become the captain of his team uh, his senior year, and they won the county tournament, very successful, went on and played Division Three college. Now, he has an incredibly successful company called Game 7, and he does incredible amounts of work with Nike. He works directly with LeBron James and all these NBA guys when you know, he's running events for them and dealing with them, and he has a really high-profile company called Game 7, and he's just a product of the environment now. You know, I had the privilege to work with Justin throughout his high school career, and it was his high school basketball coach. He has a couple of uh, the sports psychologists that works for me, worked with Justin back in the early 90s. So it was that ecosystem mm -hmm. that we create that absolutely helps kids go on to succeed. That's, that's one example. Yeah. And, his, and his buddy, uh, who also came in, uh, is the founder of Untucked. They went to the same school. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, you know, um, Chris Riccobono, uh, he was an, a Parisi athlete as well. So, and they both went to Don Bosco High School. So when they, they came in, so it's really cool to see these guys go on and, you know, mm. I think you know, a, lot, a lot more successful than I am, which is great, you know? Yeah. What do you, what do you think of some of those sort of what I'll call success traits or success habits that kind of, that you build into people that you see make them both successful on and off the field? You know, is it things like resilience? Is it goal setting? What, what you know, if you had to sort of, when you've, you've worked with the, the top in the world, you know, what, what are some of those things that, that are important uh, skills? Yeah, you know, I mean, it all comes down to, you know, just honesty and trust, right? I mean, that's the foundation to everything. And we all, we, it, you start honesty with yourself, being honest with yourself. You know, did I give my best effort? And we keep pounding on that with kids. And we know if you're not honest with yourself, you can never be honest with anybody else. And, you know, that's the foundation to business relationships, all relationships, marriage, whatever. You know, it's all about trust and honesty. And then we build off you know, our core values. So honesty, and, which helps create positive in relationships. But honesty is not always positive, right? No, yeah. Honesty is not always. So we understand that, right? Uh, and, and, but if, you, if you're always honest, it will eventually go positive, And that will ultimately lead to a more successful life, fulfilling life. And to, me, to us, we, we quantify that as leading to excellence and service. Those are our value systems. So, with that, we feel laying that foundation, you know, with our athletes and, and bringing those types of, of principles into the session, not so much where it's, we don't lecture about this stuff, but we have strategies and metaphors that we deliver. And, and a lot of things we do are strategy, strategy driven. Uh, and we train our coaches uh, to deliver these types of message, messages uh, in a way that is wrapped around the training content. So the kids are, are getting this information 
And w- what's great is I, again, have the resources to bring in top sports psychologists, top nutritionists to, to help create our curriculum because the curriculum training piece is, is just one, one element. It's one piece to it. So I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, so, uh, so, so I guess, you know, in terms of success traits that people, that make people successful in life yeah, and business. Yeah, So of honesty, uh, what you're saying is, is, is an important one. You know, what, what, what else would you... Yeah, yeah, thank you for bringing me back because <laughs> I went off on a tangent on the... Uh, uh, really building resilience. Uh, I think resiliency... Uh, you know, there's injury resiliency, but then there's mental resiliency because we're going to get knocked down. You know, kids are going to get knocked down in sports. That's why sports is such a great metaphor because you're going to you're going to lose, you're going to get beat. You know, things are you going to get back up. So Emmett Smith, here's an example. Here's one of the stories we tell in our sessions. Emmett Smith, all-time NFL leading rusher, 18,000 plus yards, almost I think it's almost 13 miles he rushed for with the football. Average rush was almost four yards or right around four yards. So let's call it 12, 12 feet or so, almost three meters, right? Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, three, four meters. But think about this, running for almost 13 miles and getting knocked down every 12 feet and getting knocked down hard by a 260 pound linebacker or a defensive end or, or a cornerback. What Emmett Smith, why he's the all-time leading rusher is because he got, not only because he got knocked down, he got back up. He got back up more than anybody else. So the story, we're going to get knocked down in life. You got to get back up. You got to get back up. And you got to learn from those knockdowns. You got to get better from those knockdowns. And you got to continue to refine your strategy, continue to improve your approach. And, and never stop that that pursuance of excellence, because that's true mastery. It's, the, it's keep on going on, you know, and, and that's what we do. We keep on going on, and it's, it's a great motto, and, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely a big piece. Yeah, and do you think that's why, I, I guess, when you look at failure, whether it's in learning a new skill, you know, going in, building a business, do you think that resilience is what's required to kind of deal with that, I guess, what nowadays, we, you know, we would call failure? Do you think that's the way to kind of deal with, because I guess you're going to have a lot of failure, whether you're in sales or yep. opening the business or creating, you know, learning a new skill. Is, 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 is that what you teach people to kind of overcome those inevitable failures? Yeah, I mean, I think, and that, that happens naturally because when we're teaching a movement or we're, we're developing a new skill or, or creating a more enhanced motor vocabulary or, or building movement literacy or improving strength, you know, there's going to be times in the session we don't do as well as we want. So we're going to build upon that. Mm. And a lot of times our athletes are talking to our coaches, you know, during the season or they, they talk about their tough losses and we're building off that. So, you know, although, you know, we don't focus on failure, uh, but we, we, we hit it, di- you know, smack in the eye, like right, right in the face. And we say, okay, we're going to, we're just going to get better from that. We're going to learn from that because there's, there's really our philosophy. There's no such thing as failure, just learning experiences. And, you know, the people that are most successful in life, from my research, they fail the most. You know, when you really think about, it, look at Thomas Edison, you know, 10,000 ways to try to figure out how to make the light bulb. I mean, that's a true story, right? He, he failed 10,000 times before he discovered electricity. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these are all things that we continue to drive and we tell a lot of stories and, you know, I mean, not every session, but, you know, we, we, the kids know when they come there, it's, it's more than just a workout. Mm. It's and, more than just a workout. And what about on the flip side then? So I suppose success is what people are going after, but is there a fear of getting too, you know, attached to success? And, and you know, do you try and, like you do with failure, create a middle ground? Is that something that's important to do with succeeding? You know, what's your, what's your view on success and how to put that yeah. into perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think success, I think my dad is the most successful guy I know. And, and here's, here's why. He's, he never made a lot of money, um, doesn't have a lot of material things. The guy's just happy. You know, he's just fulfilled, right? Um, and I think success is just happiness. You know, because there's a lot of people in this world that have a lot of money, a lot of money or a lot of material things, but they're not happy, right? You, you read about different actors or whoever, you know, just committing suicide or crazy things and you know, my God, how, 
And, and I, we just say, I mean, are you happy? Are you, what, are you happy with yourself? Are you happy with what you're doing? Doesn't mean you have to win all the time. Doesn't mean you have to make a certain amount of money. Doesn't mean you have to do, but are you just fulfilled? Are you fulfilling yourself? And that's a never ending process. Like the self fulfillment. It's just like, oh, I'm fulfilled today. And we're just, every day of now is just going to go on. No, what fulfills you? You know, we all have different things that fulfill us, right? So I think the training process, at least with us, is a piece of that overall success, right? It teaches them some success skills. I actually have a, a 13 hour uh, jump drive audio uh, called Success Skills. And I go through my entire, just kind of like we're doing here over 13 hours, it's all, it's like, you know, 20 chapters of titled success skills that we have. And it's with my mentor, Dr. Rob Gilbert, sports psychologist that I met when I was 18 years old. And he, he taught me success skills and I've applied them, you know, being a, you know, blue collared, blue collared kid from a, from a, you know, Italian family in New Jersey who figured out how to throw the javelin far enough to uh, go to Finland. Right. And that, that's my story. And from that day on, I, you know, learned a lot of strategies through Dr. Gilbert and a lot of sports psychology, a lot of personal development. I've been a personal development junkie my whole life. You know, just all the Zig Ziglar's and Tony Robbins of the world went to all their seminars and all their cassette tapes. And, uh, you know, myself and, and Bobby Capuccio were like personal development junkies, right? We, we dive into this stuff just to a point because I like sharing this information, especially with kids. And that's what we, we do with our coaches. Yeah. What well, you've worked with a lot of top NFL players, I yeah. believe. Yeah. How, how balanced do you see people that are really, you know, at the top of their, their game? Because I guess, you know, just to get to that level is pretty difficult. And then I suppose, you know, dealing with both success and failure, you know, are, are these people generally rounded or do, you know, do you see that it's something that they really need to work at, to, particularly the ones that are consistently at, at, you know, at the top of their game. Yeah, I mean, the, the high level athletes, the professional athletes, I mean, yeah, they're, they're fun to work with. Um, I, I, you know, they're very focused for the most part. Some guys kind of come in just when their contract is up and they have a year left and they, they have to get ready, you know, because they're new contract. But everybody has a different uh, viewpoint. But I think the uh, mentality of the pros, at least that we work with, uh, they are focused, they are serious, they are, you know, they are committed, it's their livelihood. Um, and, you know, we, you know, ironically, we do the same things with them as we do with the younger kids. Really? Because they need it too. A lot of people think, oh, they're pros. They need the confidence. Right. Because, you know, think about the competition they're going against. <laughs> they're going against all these other pros too, and they're making a living from it. So, you know, they're, they're sometimes second guessing themselves. And we do the same types of things with those guys. They need it. They're big kids. You know, they're, they're really, they're in their early 20s, mid 20s. You know, they still, you know, especially if they haven't heard a lot of this stuff before, you know, and, uh, but you know, that's, that's what we do. And we found that, you know, everyone, you know, has their own kind of philosophy and their own work ethic. We would like to think we, we help improve that, you know, their work ethic and their focus uh, with all, everyone we work with. Mm. You mentioned the word confidence. What, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think that lack of confidence sort of holds people, you know, whether you're in sports, whether you're in business, do you think that lack of confidence sort of holds people back from their potential in a lot of cases? Oh, without a doubt. And like, so we talk a lot about confidence. We also talk a lot about self-esteem. Right. And, and self-esteem really is, um, really is comprised of, of three things. I mean, first it's, it's an affiliation, being a part of, a, of a, an affiliate, a family, right? I mean, the gang activity in, in the U.S. is growing, right? In the state of California, the gang activity is growing. And why do people join gangs? They're not affiliated with something, a family, a sports team. They, and that gang is their family. Huh? So, so the power of affiliation is the first piece to self-esteem, you know, and we understand that. So we like to think of the Parisi Speed School, it's their team. You know, we have a uh, uh, saying called one team, one mission. Uh, one mission, one team. So, you know, we're all part of this, this Parisi family, right? Uh, the second part of, of self-esteem is having a uh, competency, you know, developing a competency. And that could be, it could be speed, it could be a sports skill, it could be anything in life. When Parisi, we're going to improve your competency and speed. We're going to get you faster. Because when you improve competency, you improve confidence. See, that's the second piece of self-esteem. And when you have an affiliation, and you are improving your competence, you create a higher self-worth. 
See, that's self-esteem. So again, these are all, these are all concepts that the Parisi Speed School has done a deep dive into, you know, and this is what we train our coaches in. You know, so we're, we're going to that next step. So they understand what self-esteem really means and getting that affiliation with those kids, making them feel part of your facility, right? I mean, in health, in our business, in, in clubs, that's a big part of your retention strategy. Mm -hmm. Is that a power of affiliation, right? There's clubs that have strong affiliation that grow because of, they want to be part of that team. Everybody has a favorite sports team. Why do people have a favorite sports team? Affiliation, you know, like New York Yankees, they're my team. It's, you know, it's the affiliation, it's the connection for all the other Yankee fans. So there's a lot of science behind this and there's a lot of reason why people, people act this way and, but it's important to understand why and when you do that, you can create uh, a great community, you can create, help kids improve their competency and ultimately, what better gift or what better job in the world than to give a young child a higher self-esteem? What's more important than that that we can be doing with, to me, that I can be doing with my life? Mm. You know, that I, I'm giving, I'm teaching coaches on how to give kids around the world a higher self-esteem. We just launched in China, Michael Bo in Beijing. I'm blown away. They are just crushing it to a point where now they're, they've become a, a master distributor for us in China. So we're literally doing this around the world. And 25 years ago, so I'm going to change the world. That was my big, I'm going to change the world one child at a time. And we're starting. I think we're starting to make an impact. Yeah. Yeah. How would do you think you could transfer that to adults that have kind of probably been a little bit broken in the process and probably hadn't had that when they were, were kids? And I suppose if you're, if you're training adults now, do you, you think it's possible to help them build confidence and, you know, with, in, in, in you know, the world of fitness? Is there ways to, to make that happen? Because I guess, you know, if you look at a lot of, I suppose, fitness clubs, struggle to keep people coming in the doors and uh, you know probably don't have that sense of community and, and people that don't have the confidence to even I suppose go into that because they don't feel good about themselves you know what, what are ideas if you could uh, you know have a blank piece of paper to solve sure. that? It's a great question and um, you know kids obviously are easier to influence than adults so a consultant of mine was my COO then CEO now he's my consultant very bright guy, uh, Dr. Paul Staples. He has his PhD in educational psychology. So he's a behavioral scientist by trade. And his, he's been my right-hand guy for now, you know, almost 13 years. And he actually, very skilled, he actually built out all the Marriott's training and development. He reported directly to Mr. Marriott. And he built all their training and development out. And again, being a behavioral scientist, he, he says it's, it's very difficult to, to change behavior in adults, right? You can modify behavior, but it's difficult. Now, it's not impossible. Mm. So my feeling is with the adults in terms of the things that we do, we can modify their behavior, modify their, their, self, their perspective on certain things. Uh, and I do feel when people wanna change, they can and they will uh, and if we help lead them to it, but they have to want to make that decision. Where with kids, it becomes almost they're figuring it out. So mm -hmm. innately, we can make that change. With adults, it's a lot more difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible because anything is possible. Um, that's why it keeps us going because we have a thriving adult business as well. But uh, it's a lot more difficult. But we, we just stick to the script and we share our strategies with youth and adults. And you know, the adults think it too. Who doesn't like to be motivated? Who doesn't like to hear a motivational story? Who doesn't like to see a metaphor or, or you know, see something that's inspiring? Mm. Like we all do, right? And, and I think that's you know, the next step. I think a lot of coaches in this industry, a lot of trainers, they need to realize this is a, this is a big part of what we do. Yeah. What do you think of some of the things like in terms of takeaways to, to you know, we spend a lot of time working on the body. We've got the, you know, the latest bit of equipment, the latest workout. What are some of the things that you think, you know, easy to take away things that we can use for, I guess, more adults like ourselves to, to sort of help build those success traits that you build into the young 
athletes do you say? You know, what are, what are those kind of obvious ones to start with? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the foundation, the biggest one is, is getting enough sleep, right? I mean, it's right. like, yeah, I mean, I mean, the sleep, you know, the science around sleep is, is huge. We tell everybody that's when, you know, it's when your body recovers. I mean, it's, it's incredible how important it starts with sleep. You, you, you got to get the right sleep because if you don't get the right sleep and you're tired, you're not fully recovered, it's hard to do anything well. Mm -hmm. Right? If you're fully rested and you're, then you can go work out and do all the other things, right? And then the next step, and, and people have heard this before, and it's like, you know, <laughs> preaching to the choir, right? Then it's just drinking enough water, just being properly hydrated. You know, I wrote a book on fascia. Fascia is, you know, 90% water and collagen, really? right? Yeah. And, and, you know, we've got to have a properly hydrated system. We won't perform well. We won't, we won't run as fast if we're not properly hydrated. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, obviously, AIDS, digestion, there's all these different things. I mean, body's majority water, but, and then it leads to obviously, you know, just less sugar, you know, we just gotta manage sugar. Those are the big three. I mean, right there, sleep, hydration, and managing sugar and simple carbs, you know, because the sweet foods and all that stuff. If we do that and we focus there, I think the working out and, the, and all that just starts to build. Right. It really starts to steamroll and it starts to come. And, you know, it's, it's cool with kids because we tell them, you know, hey, man, make sure you drink your water, make sure you get your sleep, make sure, you know, you don't eat a lot of sugar. It's not complicated, right? It's three things mm -hmm. which can make a major impact. With kids, you got to keep it really simple. Right. Like three things. Keep things in three, yeah. right? We like to keep things in three. Make sure you go to bed on time, right? Make sure you drink a lot of water throughout the day, stay hydrated all the time, and just go easy mm -hmm. on the sugar. You know, and, and on the process, you know, cakes and candies and things like that. And for the most part, you're going you're gonna to be okay. Right. Now, there's other things, you know, fried foods and all that. But with kids, they're kids. They're going to burn it off. I'm not saying I'm not promoting fried foods. But, yeah, you've got to be a kid. You've got to enjoy some things. And I'm not saying not to eat, you know, birthday cake or not to enjoy, you know, sweets. But just manage it. Yeah. And are there any sort of mindset rituals that you do or you have seen are good to kind of keep you into that? you know, those habits in terms of kind of keeping a positive and outlook on what you're doing as well, you know, whether it's yeah. goal setting or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we tell our kids, you know, get, get some alone time. Put the phone down and meditate and think and, and just, and we should do this as adults, you know, just, you got to decompress. Like, you, you really have to sit in a chair or, or sit down and and just close your eyes or go to bed early when you're still awake and just lie in bed and think. Like just, just think, just let your mind think. Just, just take some time, you know? Uh, whether it be when you're in church or whatever your ritual is, spend more time thinking. And I, I believe, you know, when we do that, we share that, you know, kids, they grow from that. You know, I mean, like people call it meditation, you know, mm -hmm. you know different, different cultures, you meditate. And, you know, I, I believe there's a lot of value to that. So, you know, we might do that before a session. We'll lay everybody down, close your eyes. And we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, do this for a couple minutes and just lay down flat on your back. Just relax, close your eyes, and let's, we're just gonna think total silence. We're not gonna do it for 20 minutes, but we'll do it for three, four minutes. And it seems like a long time when you're sitting there with your eyes closed, mm -hmm. but you're, you're thinking about it. And then you get up and you're going, you're a little more, you know, fired up and okay. Because maybe you thought about something that you didn't, you didn't think of in a while <laughs> that motivated you. Yeah, I guess it's a bit of a reset. I suppose your lives are so full with, you know, when, when it, most of the time, even me, when I have a minute, the first thing I do is go to my phone and then you're checking all the different apps that are buzzing at you. And then you're talking to someone and you, you're an app. So I suppose it's very rare to actually have even a few minutes you know apart from when you're in the shower which for me is when i get a lot of ideas and i'm like oh i need to remember this <laughs> me too in the shower right and and we're, we're missing that as a society we're not getting enough time away from electronics and to meditate and to really just think like my son in his room he has a whiteboard i have whiteboards in the room so i leave messages sometimes <laughs> in their room right like little small whiteboards and he wrote he wrote big words on his whiteboard think with an explanation point, think, you know, like, because, and when he heard, I, when I shared that with him a while ago, he, uh, he does, you know, and he's like, he's, he's, you know, Conscious, thinking, he's focusing, yeah. you know, he's, he's focused, he's thinking about, because when you sit and think, you think about goals, you think about you know, how to overcome challenges, it's, it's, I think, I feel it's really healthy. Yeah. So I've, I've heard you recently put out a book, which 
people I know have said is really revolutionary. And, you know, there's, there's stuff that's been learned in this book that you know, people don't know. Tell us a bit about your new book and, yeah. and, and, and some of the sort of interesting findings that probably we didn't know about a few years ago. Sure, well, uh, you know, I, I still go to a lot of continuing education and what's really fun, I, I travel the world, I'll go to different speed clinics and, and just always learning and I, I, that's what I love about it. Now, I'm, I'm a, still a student and I love being a student and I love learning from, from guys around the world. So um, I've been a longtime friend and colleague of Dan Path. He's a world-renowned uh, sprint coach. He's coached over 20 Olympic and world champion medalists in track and field. Uh, very well-respected coach. Uh, the college level, Olympic level, and so on. He was actually the, the, the head of the London Olympic team in, in, uh, in uh, 12, I guess, when, when London had the Olympics, right? Was that 12? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, he oversaw all their, the, yeah, their, their track and field team. You know, they hired him to go over. Uh, that's the level he's at. So I went to an event that he ran in, uh, a while ago, and he was talking about fashion hydraulics and the, 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 this, the body's a hydraulic system and fascia plays such a big role. And I'm like, man, that's really interesting. I didn't realize, I started doing research. I, he sent me some articles, I started looking into them. I'm like, wow, this is, this is really interesting how fascia plays such a big role. And then I said, man, this information is revolutionary. I gotta write a book on this. So all, what I did is I interviewed some of the top people in the world, like a Tom Myers and Dr. Tom Finley, who's one of the founders of the Fascia Research Congress. And I told my story about my uh, discovery, uh, you know, how I understood this fascia system in the body and how I've been training it in the Parisi system for 27 years but didn't know I was training it. So fascia is obviously the cellophane wrapping that wraps every muscle, muscle cell, muscle group, organs, uh, nerves, blood vessels, everything. It's everywhere in your body. It, it permeates throughout your body, through cells, everywhere. And if we didn't have it, everything would just fall. You know, you had no structural integrity at all. And have we always known that that is the case, or have we recently we, found we, that? Um, we've, we've known that was the case, but we didn't realize how important it was. And now we know that it has six times more the proprioceptors and nerve endings than muscle oh. in fascia. Now that's proven by science. And we're discovering more and more every day. So um, not understanding this system, this system also gives us uh, a lot of our, our, our stretch reflex or our explosive power, our sprinting ability, our jumping ability, plays a much bigger role. So when I say fascia, it's all the connective tissue in the body, it's the tendons, it's, the, it's all the connective tissue because when we jump, we think of the Achilles tendons, right? And this, this, this tissue, which is also classified as fascia, the tendons are fascia, but lots of fascia bundled together. Fascia is basically collagen, and, and water, you know, for the most part, has two different types of cells, uh, fascia sites and fibroblast cells that make up fascia. But we have this connective tissue that permeates throughout our body. And, you know, the Achilles tendon is part of the fascia tissue. And it stores a lot of energy. Now, we understand the Achilles tendon stores a lot of energy, but that type of storage, that tissue is collagen, so it's non-calorie dependent. So it doesn't need calories to do its job. It's a collagen and water matrix, right? It's called an extracellular matrix. Uh, the fascia system is outside the cells. Um, but they've done studies on kangaroos where kangaroos expend more energy walking a mile than hopping for a mile. Because all this energy they use to hop is free. It's free energy. And we have a lot of that, and great runners know how to utilize that energy. And now we're learning how to train that system to generate more of that free energy, to not only run faster, but to run longer, expending less energy. Now this is all proven by science. It's incredible, that's why I wrote the book. I'm coming out with a second book, Fascia Training, the application, because the first book is basically about this system, what it is, and why haven't we discovered it? Yeah. We've been studying anatomy for over 500 years, and now all of a sudden, because when we've dissected in the past for 500 years, we just disregarded it. We didn't think it had any value. Even in surgeries, disregarded it, didn't have any value. But now we have the imaging equipment, ultrasound, we can do in vivo, get cameras underneath the skin and look at the fascia and study it. Now we have the technology over the last 10 to 20 years to really study this system. And they're realizing, wow, 
this system is loaded with nerve, nerve endings, loaded with sensitivity, and plays a much bigger role in our body than we ever thought. And from an athletic performance standpoint, it is huge. So I, I, I give the analogy, athletes have different types of, of bodies, right? And you know, are you a muscular driven athlete or a fascia driven athlete or what we call connective tissue driven athlete? So say like somebody like LeBron James, he's a little bit more muscular driven. You know, he's a big guy, right? Uh, you look at somebody like uh, you know, Kevin Durant, he's not as muscular. He's more connective tissue driven, right? He's more fascia driven. And if you look at all athletes, even in football, your wide receivers and cornerbacks are fascia driven for the most part, right? Your fullbacks, your tight ends, your linebackers are more muscular driven. You know, so we, we like to look at the, the, the linebackers, the tight ends, the fullbacks, they're rhinos, and your wide receivers, your corners are cheetahs. Right. Different, different animals there, right? Different, different body types, different nervous systems. I mean, when I say different, I meant the recovery, the energy needed, what they use to run. Muscular athletes are gonna you know, be dependent more on muscle. Mm. You know, although all the systems are always in play with everything we do. Muscular system, nervous system, fascia connective tissue system, cardio system, they're always all in play, but you gotta identify what's the driver right. for that athlete. And what's is that the, genetic? That, 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 is, that is genetic for the most part, what their driver is. Right. You know, so, so Saquon Barkley, he's more of a muscular driven athlete, right? Where Odell Beckham in the US, he's more of a connective tissue driven athlete, right? Uh, so, you know, you, you look at these different athletes and you, and you look at their training styles too. You know, what do they gravitate to? You know, because you have to train for both. And there's a way to train the fascia system. Right. So some athletes that have been muscular driven for a long time, I'm noticing more of those athletes today, they're saying, okay, I have a foundation of strength. I need to, I need to do more fascia based training. And fascia is more medicine ball training, more body weight training, not as much heavy weight. But we, we, all, we, need, we need all the different types of training. You know, it's called mechanical transduction. Right. Mechanical transduction is a mechanical stimulus to the cell, which causes an electrical or chemical response or change to the cell. So what kind of mechanical stimulus are we putting to that cell, right? Is it a resistance isotonic load? Is it a dynamic isokinetic load? Is it a medicine ball load where we can go through a full range of motion where it's omnidirectional? some maximal load. So, you know, understanding what's happened at the cellular level uh, in terms of the types of stress we put on the cell. And it, you know, it could be f a force type of stress, it could be vibration, it could be pressure, it could be impact, it is gonna, is gonna change that fascia, it's gonna change that tissue, and it's gonna adapt to the types of stress we put on it. Uh -huh. and, and this is, the book gets into this. The yeah. book goes into the science and defines these, the, the, this terminology, but what's cool is what we've been doing at the Parisi Speed School for 27 years, it's all been really dead on. Uh, we just didn't know why, like it all works, but we didn't know, now we know the science on why our training, how we get athletes faster, understanding the fascia system and how it relates to the muscle. There's a great study, 2002 Tokyo study that measured um, ultrasound, uh, a, a gentleman lying supine on like a calf machine, but it was a machine that you can explode off of and they were uh, ultrasounding his leg and they were you know EMG and they did all this technology that a force plate and when he was doing an isotonic traditional strength training movement they noticed that the muscle they looked at the muscle actin myosin that was doing the majority of the work to do that exercise when they lightened the weight and they did an explosive movement they noticed the energy storage was in the tendon and the muscle was well, more isometric was more of a stabilizer. Now they both contracted, they both did their work, but the tendon became more dominant in the explosive movement. So we have more energy and more power athleticism in our connective tissue than we ever thought. Right. And connective tissue can absolutely be trained. Right. So I, so I, in, in terms of the, the person on the street then, you know, what's, what's the relevance of this? Are you saying that, you know, if they go to a gym and they do certain types of training, you like muscular training now, are you saying that they, it's important to kind of think about utilizing this sort of fascia system? Yes, to... because that's injury resiliency. Okay. A lot of times we get injured, it's, it's the connective tissue that's getting injured. 
because right. uh, the connective tissue is intertwined around the muscle, inside the muscle, the epimyosin, the endomyosin. We have, we have this connective tissue all around us and it's what holds everything together. Even around the individual cells is, is fascia. You know, it's holding everything together. And then around bundles of cells, and then around bundles of muscle groups, then around organs, around bone, everywhere. And I also run dissection classes. We run, I've run multiple uh, human cadaver, unembalmed, fresh cadaver dissection for fascia. I've done them in Colorado, I've done them in New Jersey. We bring in, you know, NFL strength coaches, we bring in top coaches to, to dissect unembalmed cadavers to study fascia. I've done, I just run a course for a bunch of MDs, believe it or not, uh, for a bunch of MDs here in New Jersey and Atlantic Health. But to go back to the, the average person in a gym, we want to build a, a, a injury resilient fascia system in the gym. And quite frankly, a lot of your equipment does that. I don't know if you even knew that, like the sandbags. It's basically omnidirectional submaximal loading develops the fascia system. So multi-directions, but a lot of things you guys do and teach, mm. don't know if you knew this, <laughs> and this wasn't planned, <laughs> I'm just I'm being honest. Omnidirectional, sub-maximal loading, where you're moving in multiple directions because fascia is gonna respond to the lines of stress you put on it. And fascia is what gives us our body's integrity and stability. Right. You know, holds everything together. We want it to be vibrant. We want the fascia to have this lattice type shape okay. the lattice it creates that spring you know when you when you're young you have that spring in your step yeah. right and when you get old people lose that spring well their fascia system becomes matted oh, right. like felt and it becomes locked and it loses that spring movement movement omnidirectional all different types of movement controlled not not, not out of control control with some maximal loading facilitates healthy fascia. And it also facilitates, I'm gonna go a little deep here in the science, so for the coaches out there, you're gonna dig this. For the layman, you might not, but it's important because this is cutting edge stuff. There's a cell called the fascia site, and that produces uh, something called hyaluronic acid. And this hyaluronic acid is kind of like, like an olive oil that, get, that lubricates the fascia layings, the fascia layers so muscles can glide over one another because all of our muscles need to, need to slide. And if we don't do this type of training often enough, that, that olive oil becomes like honey, oh, right. sticky, and then it becomes like peanut butter. And then you really lost the, your step. You really lost the hop wow. in your step. So omnidirectional submaximal loading, really important to facilitate this hyaluronic acid that's facilitated through the fascia sites that keeps us gliding and moving and fluid and athletic. And just as the, 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 the average person, they're not gonna dunk a basketball, but they wanna be able to move, bend down, pick up their grandkids, like just, just go for a walk, you know, just do things. Walking is a physical dynamic activity that fascia plays a, a role in the spring when we walk. So when you, so in terms of the relevance to, you know, dumbing it down, probably for someone like me, is what you're saying is, okay, it's important to train your muscles, it's important to, to, to have cardiovascular training, but it's also important to have fascia training. And the benefit of that is that, you know, as you're older, that sort of spring in your step, which you've lost, can be trained to come back. So you're Abs really absolutely, wow. absolutely, and you don't have to lose that. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be like when you're 20. Right. You know, you're not going to have that speed, but you can be active. And it really is a big part of this is around the fascia system that we didn't know about, and now the science is clear. I, I've just been asked to be involved in the uh, fascia research societies. You know, the top guys in the world, which I'm really excited about because they read the book and they liked it. They like the fact that I'm sharing this information about this, this new system that we've always had it, but now no one really knew about it. No. But we know now it's so powerful and I'm helping to spread the word to, mm. the, to, the, to the industry uh -huh. that we got to address this and, and there's ways to train it. I remember you also when you told me last time that it, it, it's like a sort of a spider web that kind of recreates itself. So if you're in bad posture, it kind of, it kind of knits itself it into does. that position. Yep. And, and so how does that relate to your, your posture then as well? Can yeah. you train great, to improve? Great, great question. So 
Fascia develops based on the stresses we put on our body or the lack of stress we put on our body. So if we're in this posture, you know, a rounded posture for a long period of time, even, even for a few minutes, the fibroblast cells, which are just basically little slugs that crawl all over our body, we have millions of them crawling, crawling, crawling around our body. When they sense a posture that's sedentary, that we're sitting this wrong, they're gonna start casting these webs just like a spider. They're gonna start laying down collagen around these muscle groups, around these nerves, or around these you know, connective tissues. Or, and when we get tight, or rounded shoulders, or our hip flexors, like as we sat in a long car ride, the muscles aren't tight. It's the fascia, the fibroblast, casting these webs. And when we stretch and open up, and we, you know, we're actually getting rid of the fuzz. There's a, on the web, it's called the fuzz speech. And, and when we dissect, we see you can you know, run your hand through fascia. And it's like a spider web, just getting rid of the web. Really? Absolutely. And it's now we've done the human dissection. We've seen it. We know it. We have cameras that go underneath the skin of live people. In my presentation, I have a video of a fibroblast cell casting its web live in a person. I mean, that's the technology we have today. See, most people don't even know this, but your muscles don't get tight. It's the fascia that creates the tightness, wow. you know, in the muscle for the most part in terms of what we know now. Um, so a, a gentleman, Dr. Tom Finley, who I've become close with, and it's great because he lives in New Jersey. He's an MD, a PhD, uh, also certified massage therapist and, and uh, uh, expert in rolfing. Uh, we've become close, and he's one of the founding fathers of, of the understanding of the fascist system, at least now, today, you know. Um, so it's nice to have access to him and really know the science behind it because when you really think about it, it makes sense, right? It, it really, this, this connective tissue system is, is really the system responsible for our bad posture and we have to break it up. That's why when a, massage, a good massage therapist understands the oh, fascia okay. system and they know how to break up this collagen because this collagen becomes more like felt and matted and locked down. Where we want a springy collagen system like a, a, a javelin thrower or a pitcher that like Chapman who can throw 100 miles an hour. Well, he can throw 100 miles an hour because he's developed this, this connective tissue fascia system on his, what Tom Myers would call his superficial front line you know, in anatomy trains, his super, superficial front line, he's developed an incredible whip right. of, of connective tissue. And that kind of almost acts like the Achilles tendon in the foot. He's got this big connective superficial front line that acts as that whip to throw the ball super fast. Gee. That's, that's how it works. Wow, that's incredible. So, so for someone with, you know, generally bad posture, there is through training and working with that system, you can probably get that web cast in more of a better postural you, position. You absolutely can improve. Yeah, it takes a lot of manual work, a lot right. of training, you know, obviously strengthening the weak posterior muscle groups, anterior delts, rhomboids, things of that nature that are weak and stretched, yeah. right? And then, um, you know, strengthening them and then loosening up the, the pecs. Casting you know. the web. Exactly, in getting rid of the positions. The webs that, that tighten this down. Same thing, we sit all day, so our glutes tend to shut off, yeah. right? Uh, our hip flexors get tight, they get casted, you know? So it's pulling our, pulling our pelvis forward right. and all these things happen. We're getting casted in the hip flex position, glutes shut off because they're stretched all day. So we have to activate the glutes, loosen up the hip flexors, get them worked on, you know, you know strengthen the lower back, all that stuff. And a lot of our back problems go away. You know, Dr. Stuart McGill is a master of, you know, low back pain, the, the big three exercises, understanding core health and understanding how to train the core, which is really important. And a lot of the stuff you do, you know, a lot of the programs you prescribe, you do exactly that. You know, that's what's kind of cool. The education that you deliver, yeah. you know, with your equipment uh, is really great because you don't even know a lot of that stuff is addressing the fascia system. Mm. I guess a lot of it, like, I'm, I'm sure that people are, but I, I guess a lot of people are probably not aware of that. And I suppose you don't go into a gym and it's like, okay, well, today we're going to do your fascia training. Right. And, 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 <laughs> and again, I'm all, sure it will get there. Yeah, <laughs> all the systems are always in play, yeah. right? They're always, all, they're always all in play. It's just, you know, what, what are you focusing on? What's going to be the dominant system yeah. you're, you know, you're training that day? And, uh, or where, where are you trying to focus, you know, with, with that client? So what? So your next book then, which which I guess is sounds quite interesting already, is is your you'll be showing how to apply that 
understanding into like you know how, how, what type of training and that you can now do to yes. improve that. Yeah. yeah, I mean there's it's it's called fascia training the application, and what's right. interesting, one of the key things about training fascia is being able to maximize your force production and contraction with the muscles at its shortest shortest length. Okay. So. When I'm doing a squat at the top of the squat, my glutes are at their shortest length. Right. When I'm when I'm squatting and I go down in this position that I'm in now, my glutes are lengthening. Mm -hmm. Typically, when I'm using a free weight and I'm squatting up, and we've done research on this at a university, Ken Clark, PhD bio, biomechanist at Westchester, PA. We did a force plate study with traditional weights and isokinetic uh, weight training. We used the ohm equipment. And we, we've done this third party university research and we measured force production. And when we use traditional free weight to do a squat, obviously as we come up, momentum is helping us tremendously. So the amount of force and, and contraction that we're putting on the muscle is less at the top. Right. Because we gotta slow down. Okay. When we use an isokinetic piece modality, and we, this, time, this piece we used ohm, ohm equipment, optimal human motion, it showed when we maximize our, our movement with the ohm, because it's isokinetic, it's accommodating resistance, we were able to maximize force production at the top. So like a band left. type of training? Yes. Okay. And right. when we do that, what happens is, one, we're not only generating more force at the top and then lift, but when the muscle's shorter uh, and we're contracting hard, it gets fatter. Oh, right. So it's not only, it's not only you know, it's uh, shortening, but it's getting, it's getting fatter, that, that helps facilitate healthy fascia. Oh, wow. And it also pushes uh, uh, blood flow out because the muscle's getting squeezed. Mm -hmm. And now there's research that Dr. Tom Finley shared that helps reduce cancer cells because the cancer cells try to get through the fascia and they explode. Because we have cancer cells throughout our body, we just, our immune system overcomes them. But uh, I'll get you that citation on that study from Dr. Tom Finley uh, on that specific study. But incredible, incredible research out there uh, that's going on in, in the world. I mean, it's quite exciting being in that, like what you're discovering, you know, really. Yeah, good <laughs> yeah it's fun. I mean, I, I, I got to tell you, I feel like uh, it was 28 years ago when I discovered that, man, you can, you can get faster. Like, you can improve speed. And I feel like I'm reborn here, you know, discovering the fascia system in terms of personally identifying how important it is and sharing it with the, with the industry, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, having now, what's kind of cool is now I, I can get access to almost anybody in the world, you know, all the top guys, because I help the, all the NFL strength coaches. I run their annual awards banquet at the NFL Combine, and I, um, I'm responsible to bring in their speakers, guest speakers, you know, to, to provide them continued education. It's a partnership with the NSCA and Gatorade that I run for the NFL strength coaches. So I, I, I pull in all these guys from around the world to present to them. And I had the privilege to present to them last year, or actually this year, 2019, present to them on fascia. And uh, they were, uh, I, you know, they really enjoyed the presentation because it's so new. It's really new content. So uh, we're bringing it out there. We're doing great things. And we're gonna yeah. continue to just, you know, search and just this, this, we're on a quest. You know, yeah. the, book, the book is about this, this quest of knowledge and constantly hunting. And that's what we want to teach our athletes, you know, and teach our coaches, teach everyone. Constantly be out there getting better, you know? It's like, it's never stopping, you know, what's, what's but you also got to filter it too, you know? Because you can get bombarded. I get calls yeah. every day, here's a great piece of equipment, or here's this, here's that, here's a new idea, here's this, there's all these new products or, or, or uh, supplements or whatnot. You got to learn how to filter and kind of stay in your silo and not yeah. get, you can't look at everything, but you know, I took a deep dive into fascia and feel that it's, it's worth, it's worth, ta worth yeah. taking a look at. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It certainly sounds like that. So look, I, this is exciting. We could have spent two hours just talking yeah. on fascia, yeah. but yeah, great. I want to make sure that people are, have heard this and are very turned on know sure, sure. where to get more information. So two more questions before we, we finish, but. Where, where can people go? How can they connect with you? How can they learn more about this subject that you just sure. talked about? Well, I mean, first and foremost, uh, pariseschool.com. So people that are interested in learning more about you know, speed training or Parisi or interested in Parisi license or get involved with us as a team member, pariseschool.com. Uh, we also have Fascia Training Academy, 
So that's where we have all of our courses and you know our books and things of that nature. So that's another website, fasciatrainingacademy.com. And um, you know, that's really the two main, mm -hmm. the main sites where they can reach out to us and learn more. And we're really excited. We're running fascia dissection courses now with top, top experts, you know, like Dr. Tom Finley attended our previous course and answered questions throughout the three days. And we, you know, have top dissectionists. And what's nice, you, you sit there and you see a, a live, you know, not alive, but you see an unembalmed cadaver, and we dissect for fascia to understand, to feel it. People are feeling the IT band. You can tow a truck with the IT band. You know, and people don't realize the IT band wraps around the whole thigh. It's just a little thicker around the outside because we have to support ourselves. People who ride horseback, horses for a long time or a living, or, right, their, their IT band, they're, they're much thicker on the inner thigh. You know, so, and you'll see how when, if anyone wants to do a dissection course, you'll see how this, this system is. But that's where they can learn more, those two websites. Right, okay. So final question, Bill. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and made it possible, or other people have said is impossible and made it possible. I know we've spent a long time talking about that, but what, what would you say in your words is a memorable example of escaping your own limits? Yeah, just just helping athletes, just showing that speed can be improved. Because back in the early 90s, I mean, no one believed that, you know, that wasn't a farce. But um, it was, you know, just, just overcoming that obstacle and, and, and having a dream, being $50,000 in debt, living at home at 24 years old. Actually, lived at home until I was 27 because when I started the business, I had no money for the first three years, for the first couple of years, and then we started to really roll. Um, but yeah, that, that was it for me, skipping my limits and, and just going out on the limb. Now, you know, over 25 years ago, quarter century, and I can't believe I'm sitting here talking about, you know, 1993 when I started, or actually 92 is when I really started the business in the van, 93 when I got the first location. Mm -hmm. Then in 96, it really started to kick in, 97, we had a blowout year, so. Um, no, that, that's it, man. I really appreciate you having me on the show. I really love the content you put out to the industry. Uh, I think you put out great education. Like I said, when I, you know, when we ran into each other at one of the trade shows, I was like, wow, you, you know, you do some great things. I, I really was caught by your, your education. I was caught by how you've done some things and how you packaged it up. I was, I was impressed. So it's, it's always great to see another colleague in the industry just looking to do good things and help the industry. You know, I think there's a lot of people out, a lot of club owners, a lot of equipment manufacturers. I, and I have relationships with a lot of different organizations and it's all about, hey man, we all can help each other make the industry better, more respected, you mm -hmm. know, out there. And I think we're doing a good job as an industry, you know, URSA and the different organizations out there. It's just about helping each other. I'm a big collaborator. You know, my whole career is all about collaboration. And even people that compete with me or whatever, it's all cool. You know, how do we collaborate? How do we, how do we elevate the industry? How do we become more respected as an industry? And, and if we can do that and work together, even though we might compete, whatever, but let's do it respectfully. And let's, just, let's, let's help kids and let's move to the next. There's enough to go around. Yeah. You know, there's more water in the sea makes all boats float higher, yeah. right? I mean, so that's... That's my thing. Yeah, I think that's a great message. There's some wonderful stuff there, and certainly talking to you, it just makes you see that there's, as you say, there's, there's so much water out there that people are not even looking at. Um, and and, and I, I, you know, I guess what we hope to do in these sort of podcasts is to show people all these opportunities where you can look and how you can really make a difference to, sure. to so many people's lives. So it's a, it's a great story. I, you know, hopefully when you get your second book out, I'd love to you know, go in a bit deeper on that and to, to learn more. Thank you very much My for coming pleasure, out Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.